Hello everyone, Master Xeon 1001 here, and in this video I am pleased to announce the release of Hardop 00987 Francium. This release has been a long time in the making, and you've already been experiencing most of it because it's been sprinkled throughout a lot of the micro updates in the form of uh, quality of life changes and of course the uh, new edition of Every Scroll or ever scroll which has uh, taken over the bull scroll mod systems that were previously inside of hard ops so the easiest way to uh, trigger it is just inside of your q menu if you have a selection ever scroll will be listed and just shift clicking it will allow you to go through a modifier scroll there's many options for it and i've even done a video going over ever scroll in depth so that way you can get the most out and find out what's available for it as far as how you can use it and even use its apply to capabilities to get the most out of it and apply select modifiers on the fly in order to get a particular result so without further ado let's go ahead and jump into it So as always, our quest is always against box. So if you were to say draw a box with box cutter and another box and another box and another box and then Alt W switch over to hop tool and use the dot to bring back a shape and then delete the shape, you will get an error with hop tool. And right now it's um, not having an issue making a fool out of me, but there is the error. And so if I continue to try to click this, eventually it will crash. And this was an annoying little bug, but luckily we were able to get taken care of. So here we are in the latest version of Blender with the latest version of Hard Ops and Box Cutter. So we will just draw our shapes. And if we Alt W, we can switch over, bring back our cutter, delete them, go back, delete these cutters as well, grab this cutter, also delete it, and we won't have any issue there. In fact, now we can Alt W, go back over to Box Cutter, and just continue working without any error and without any crashing. And so that was one of the small things we wanted to take care of in this update was getting that particular issue taken care of where you would delete a shape and then whenever you press control the next time an error would show up because it was referencing a shape that was no longer there. That error has now been resolved. So when it comes to two shape, it can be always a little difficult to explain because there's such a history behind it. If we look at our opt-ins, we can see that we're under two shape V2, which is called Two Shape Interactive, and is also known as the default. In order to make this interesting, let's uh, perform a couple of cuts on our shape just to uh, make it a little unique. So we'll perform a box cut. We'll shift it to live, move it up a little bit, and shift the bull to something called an outset, and we'll press T in order to adjust the thickness. And then we'll hide that and perform a box cut on top of that, and just cut inside. And we've created this really interesting little shape that's you know pretty worthy. So let's say that we actually wanted to cut out everything else around it except for just the shape itself. So now we have just that. Uh, let's say we wanted to turn this into a box. We could press Q, O, T, which brings us up to two shape. And normally when you first jump into it, it gives you a box and by control scrolling, you can actually change which side the box is placed on, which is very handy. Sometimes you actually just want to add a box on the end of something in order to begin extending like you see me doing here. For example, um, you know, I'm gonna try to be a little more in depth than usual. So now that I have this box, I can just begin extending on it, even though I probably should undo that, apply to scale and then do that operation and then we can perform, we can begin performing our cuts to start integrating this. Let's set our origin to geometry. Uh, let's set our origin between this edge and this edge. And Alt X, X to reset. Sorry, I had my mirror on some uh, settings I was messing with earlier. And for this object, we really can't control things. So I'm just going to Shift A, add an empty of a sphere, right click because even if we don't always have control, we can add the ability to have control. So that's what this empty is gonna be. We'll just move it over and get it just around this box. And so now we've two shaped a box and we have that box just kind of on the other side, just chilling. And we could continue cutting this to add more integration to make these two match up. And we can select both these shapes and press QOT again and control scroll and put a box just below. Sometimes you just want a box below. You might be watching this and thinking, oh, well, I'll just shift A out of box. Well, good luck with that. Um, I've inserted enough boxes that I felt, you know, 
it is time to try making our own form of uh, insert a box. But really, this thing was um, an idea brought to us by someone who wasn't working with us, and it just took off and became a life of its own, where now, so I hid the mirror object. There's a couple of ways I could get it back. I'm gonna use Everscroll with modifier, and I'm just gonna shift click mirror to bring it back, and then I could just mirror that to the other side. So if you watch the Everscroll video, it all plays right into that. So I'm just working on a shape and extending it. We'll select everything again, with an active selection, of course, and press QOT, and we're back in two shape again. And we can actually do something like, let's say we want to repeat this over and over. Well, I'm gonna press X and change the axis, and we'll just bring this in and perform what's called a decap, and we'll leave it offset it just a little bit, and then press C to get some caps, and now this object has been made into a decap array mesh. And so while it looks exactly the same right now, we can actually press Q, go in array, and if we, wrote to, if we uh, roll the wheel, we're now adding additional array segments. And the best part is this object has been built in a way where the front of this has a cap, the end of this has a cap, and this whole shape is manifold. And so if I were to just turn off array sorting by turning off the bypass, I can just perform a box cut all the way through this thing. And really just, there's no limits to what I can do to uh, begin making this object unique when it comes to cutting it and just putting angles in it and put my own spin on it. And then the best part is I can still press Q, uh, go under add modifier and then go under array and actually roll this in and out. And these modifiers are still affecting it and I can still affect things, but really, this object is now a dynamic array object, and that's just another use of two object, but continuing on with this thing like it's an adventure. Let's press QOT again. Keep in mind we're using the V2 interactive version. We haven't even begun talking about the new one that's been added, but this one is really the flagship whenever it comes to interactive object insertion. In fact, uh, a lot of work has went into this, and I'm quite proud of it, enough that I couldn't quite replace the defaults just yet with it, because there's a few things that have to be absolutely perfect in order for it to take over for the V2. And with V2, I still feel that there's a fighting chance for us to make a even better version than the version that you're seeing now, because there are some limits to everything that you're seeing. In fact, let's begin talking about those limits by introducing them. Um, let's press Alt H, bring everything back. We'll press one and just activate only our main collection. And let's just, um, Jeez, we have so much garbage here, huh? All right, so we'll just select everything, even the mirror, and let's just rotate the object. In fact, we can't just rotate it. We need to select it, and under operations, we need to choose uh, late parent, and then we can rotate it because everything's been parented. So let's say we select everything, we press QOT again. You know, QOT has been so good to us, but let's say that we're now working at an angle. Now we see that we're not able to work at that angle. Let's actually, press Q and look at the tooltip for this. Um, we see that there is no option for us to get individual with it, which is what we need. We need a state called individual in order to mess with this. We see that, you know, we could use something like convex hull, which is a whole nother piece I didn't even get to talk about, but, and we're able to place this object, but notice that we're placing it globally on the side of it and on top of it, instead of where it would be placed say locally so i'm going to power save the situation as just a um you know um ts file case uh one and we'll just save that and with that let's just um you know save the file one more time because i'm crazy and now we can actually go under opt-ins where we can choose to shape 1.5 and 1.5 is actually a revisit of the whole interactive approach that we took with interactive but aiming for some of the strengths that we had inside of classic if you're interested in classic you can toggle to it and try it out we have more than enough videos talking about two shape in this classic form but we're now going to switch it over to 1.5 and unlike two uh, we don't have as much flashiness with the drawing so it's aimed to be a little bit faster with people's computers but you also have this option called i which will allow us to basically orient it to the individual and also we have an option in here that will allow us to press Y and get only the active only. So now we're placing this cube using only the active only. So let's um, let's select this shape as our active. And we go in here again, we press I, we press Y, and we see that we're able to control scroll similar to V2, except just a slightly more limited approach 
uh, as far as drawing is concerned. So it should be easier on slower computers and we're able to get this position exactly where we need to. And the best part is we can of course scroll through and change this to whatever we need. Uh, like right now we have a sphere. Of course, I do not like oblong shapes like cylinders being oblong or spheres being oblong. So you can press E and turn equalize to be all. And now we can actually scroll through the cylinder. The cylinder, of course, has the same behavior as V2, where moving the mouse will allow you to change the cylinder. And we can press S and notice that we're able to scale it down at the root of this location. So if we're just working and attempting to extend this, right, we can just select this object, press QOT, roll this to a cube. We can press, um, let's see, Control S, which will reset the scale. And we can scale it in again, or we can just click and apply and just scale it in on the X. And we're just continuing to expand on this shape. And then you want to talk about with two shape and using convex hole is the example I showed earlier on Twitter is that you could place a cylinder, bring in another cylinder and scale it down and selecting both of these and just pressing Q O T in order to two shape, you can use convex hole and that will just form a shape actually connecting these two shapes kind of similar to what you would get if you were using collision with it and the convex hole algorithm it would just create a mesh around it, similar to this for collisions we're just using it for modeling now but if we're using two shape 1.5 we'll just go ahead and update that and let's see two shape from classic to 1.5 we'll just select both of these and we can just roll the wheel until we get to convex hole and click and this is our result. Another application of two shape that I'm quite fond of that I want to show in action is the decap system. So let's just take this cube and we'll just grab an edge, bevel it, grab these two edges, bevel them, and we'll select these faces, press Q, boolean, selection boolean, click and apply, bring that inside. And then we're already in box cutter, so we might as well switch over to some end gun and perform a few end gun cuts on this just to make it interesting. And you know, we could uh, shift click sharpen to um, basically put us in the auto smooth mode, allowing us to get the shading just right. And so I'm just going to select a point and control click around to eventually just select everything, maybe in edge mode. and control click and we will just take this opportunity to curve extract and we'll press S to smooth that. And so now we have this area that we worked on with this nice curve around it. And let's just select them both and we'll press Q, O and Q, O, T to select two shape 1.5. And we'll just roll the wheel until we get to decap. So with decap, we want to press X to change our axis and we'll just roll our wheel in and we can see the mesh underneath Let's press D and we can actually turn that off and see only the mesh. Keep in mind that this is a mesh and a curve that we're doing this to. We can press C for array caps and I'm not sure why the shading actually looks like that. That's something that I'll be getting checked into. And let's just go ahead and press C to make sure that we're on array caps and we click and apply and we can just press GZ, bring this up. And of course, let's hit it with a sharpen maybe um, an auto smooth as well, just to uh, lower that down a little bit. And if we look at our modifier stack, we can now add on to this and this object will dynamically adjust. Uh, this is one of my favorite things to do with objects, especially grabbing them and grabbing the dots and hops tool and just extending them out as I need them. Uh, for instance, if I was making this like some sort of um, longer structure, then I can just do that on the fly with the power of decap and two shape. So just showing you that that functionality is still available. However, if we compare to the experience that is actually intended for the decap that is built into V2, uh, keep in mind V2 only has a very small uh, shortcoming um, that I emphasized on with its ability to deal with local orientations of the primary object. But that aside, we press QOT and we roll the wheel back once. This is truly the experience that is awaiting you whenever it comes to two shaping an object and you can press C and notice that it brings in these two planes that I just think is just amazing along with the lines that show the outline of what we're dealing with. It can show you real easily if you're getting a little out of control with it. It automatically jumps you into array mode as well whenever you press C and then whenever you click you can apply you can just bring it back up and still do the exact same thing. So you might be wondering why even have a 1.5 version and a, 1. and a version 2 
And the difference is simple. We just wanted to try reapproaching it in a way that was a little bit less performance heavy for users who are using it on more compromised or older systems. V2 works great, but maybe a little bit of the drawing and shader overhead is a little too heavy for some older computers. So we now have a lighter version for users who need to use it in a lighter state, but also want to try out some of the more experimental things that we've been trying with it. And then in addition to that, you can see Classic, the version that started it all. So I am in a previous version of Blender with a previous version of HardOps. And if we press Q and we bring up the bevel, we see that there's no help being displayed. But if we press H, our help is now showing. The first few hotkeys shown here are O, tilde, H, and M. And these are probably some of the most uh, base hotkeys across all of our modals, meaning that if you go and use uh, any of our other modals, more than likely those hotkeys are also still present, O, tilde, H, and M. However, in this case, we see that they're in a different place because of the different array that I'm using. But just know that there are um, things that could be done in order to clean it up and make the help a little bit more uniform, a little bit more clean. And those are things that we sought to do in this latest update. So if I bring up the latest version of hard ops, we can press Q and we go under bevel. We see that things have been cleaned up a little bit and there's now an option here talking about global help under shift H. So if you're in any modal, you can press shift H and it will bring up the standard help and toggle that between that and the global help on the fly in the event that you're needing to see some of those classic help things that aren't particularly applicable to the operation that you're doing at hand because more than likely when you're going inside a modal to adjust the bevel you're just going in to make a quick adjustment and then going in it again to make another quick adjustment or perform an action but there's really no need to stay in it for a long period of time but in the event that you are and you need access to those basic hotkeys just press shift h and you can bring up in the help list a list of those classic hotkeys that are still there As everyone knows, we added wedge to the previous version of box cutter, where if you're drawing a box, you can press W and just wedge the shape. However, in this time, I'll need to alt scroll bevel in order to have it catch it on both sides properly. And then I'll click sharp in order to get the shading just right. But here we see a cut utilizing wedge and we can draw another one and we see that it automatically jumps in the wedge. And because the bevel angle has been lowered, it's able to catch that wedge as it happens because a wedge is always a rather troublesome angle to catch when it comes to dealing with the uh, angle with the bevel modifier. But we did make it a little bit easier for you to be able to alt scroll in order to pick that up. But previously in hops, we added the ability to go under Q and mesh tools and use taper, which going into taper, you can just taper an object, which comes in real handy. You can even shift scroll to change the axis or just roll the mouse in order to change the axis. I believe shift scroll should probably be moving a modifier up and down the stack, but I'll be checking into that. But new to this version is also the ability to press W and turn it into a wedge. So by pressing W, you can now turn it into a wedge and you can still scroll to will in order to choose what angle you're wedging and which axis you're wedging on. And it's really just as easy as that. So similar to box cutter, you can just get in and just wedge any shape. And that's something that I find particularly enjoyable. For example, I'll draw a box here, press W a couple of times to turn it back to box. And this is now a box. We could press Q, go under mesh tools, choose to taper it if we wanted, choose to wedge it if we want, and we could just scroll to will in order to get it to wedge just right. And shift scroll in order to rotate the angle in which we're performing that wedge and just wedge this object just as we need whenever we need it using the power of lattices. So whenever it comes to the hotkey of control shift B, it was designed to be assistive to people working with um, hard ops on a laptop and don't have access to control numpad minus and control numpad plus in order to perform booleans. If we look under our hotkey list, we see that control shift B is the bevel bool multi-tool. And it's hard to kind of describe it. Originally it was our helper. However, it's not a point to see a helper with control shift B whenever you don't have any bevels or booleans present on the object. In fact, let's bring it up. We see that this object is just purely blank. There's nothing going on. So I saw that there is no reason to show it in those cases because people love bringing up tools in cases where they're not needed. But I was determined to make control shift be this multi-tool that would be able to solve a variety of needs with just one hotkey in addition to being able to bring up the helper. So we're moving this cube into the shape and we'll select them both 
and we'll press Control Shift B, and we see that we're now inside of Interactive Boolean. And the best part about Interactive Boolean is we could just roll to will and just choose what state we want to be in. Here I am looking at inset. We could press T and adjust the thickness, get it just right. Uh, we could roll to will, go to an outset, roll to uh, press T and adjust the thickness to get it just right. Of course, we're at the mercy of Solidify when it comes to these operations. But here we are just performing a cut and now we've rolled it into a slash or a slice. So we could select this piece and we could press Control Shift B and it will now bring up the bevel boolean helper. And you can actually toggle off and on which one of these you want. But if this is a bit confusing, then just know that this update aims to simplify it a little bit. So if you want this to only be this helper, there's now a toggle for it. Where under opt-ins, there's an option for bev bull hotkey helper toggle. So by having it on, it will just make the hotkey of Control Shift B just strictly be the bevel helper. No boolean activity, nothing extra, just literally just being the helper. But for users who are using it on a laptop, I definitely recommend giving it a try because there's a, a lot of additional use that's able to be gotten out of it uh, compared to just using it in its vanilla state. So I'll just have these two objects. I'm now an interactive boolean. I could just roll these into a slice with just one roll, roll it back to being a difference. I can select this object, press Control Shift B, uh, we'll activate boolean, and let's choose to uh, see the particular bull shape of this one. So let's just press Control Shift B again and enable its visibility. Now we have this object chosen. We could press Control Shift B and we can now jump into bull shift and begin shifting this. If we were to have three objects chosen, we'll also have another case added to it. So we've duplicated these two objects have them both selected with this as our main object, press Control Shift B, we see that it jumps straight over to slash because sometimes you want to perform a multi-slash operation where you're just cutting these objects in without them actually needing to go through all the operational uh, controls of selecting this one, selecting that one, setting it up, and then going through that again with the second object. So there's a bit of logic that was aimed for here, and all these things that are created in hops, I intend to further expand on and perfect as time goes on, as we get time and resources become available and systems are put together to further support such things. But whenever it comes to just dealing with your bullions and hard ops, just know that the Bev Bull helper is there for you and that it can be toggled off to be just a helper if you need it to be. I'm going to go in and actually remove the bevel and the weighted normal, leaving us just this shape and we'll just roll the auto smooth to get something a little more acceptable. So here we are looking at a shape that has no bevel and it's only boolean. So if we have this selected, we press control shift B, notice that it throws us into pull scroll where we can actually scroll through and locate a particular boolean if we want it and brought it back and selected it. And then we could press control shift B again in order to roll through and change this into whatever type of operation we need it to be. And this is all through the same hotkey of control shift B. So for me personally, I was actually using a macro mouse with my laptop and I just had it mapped and was just working on the psychology of what I wanted this function to be. But I see that it can be confusing to new users, so there's now a toggle added to allow people to turn it off. But just know that Control Shift B, Bev Bull Multi-Tool, but if you want, you can make it just a helper, just like it used to be. So let's take a moment to make our first solenoid of the new year. So I'm gonna press X and delete that, and we'll bring in a cube. And the quickest way to delete half of a plane is to just use bisect with mirror and we'll just bisect split that in half. Tap in edit mode and we're just gonna control click mark in order to bevel this point. And we'll just roll it in. And from here we can just go under profile, choose custom and begin just playing with uh, our profile here. So the first thing I always do whenever I'm messing with profiles is I will set two points and set them both to vector so that way everything that I do inside is also vector. And from here we can just click points and just begin adding things in. Of course, dealing with this graph can be a little bit tricky at times, but I've spent a bit of time in it, so practice makes perfect. And then we'll just keep dragging points, working on straight lines. Of course, I could be OCD and just be copying values and pasting them in in order to make sure everything's absolutely precise on the Y, in fact, I might just do that. I'll just press Control C hovering over that, Control V, Control V, Control V, 
control C, control V, control V, control V, just for a little absolute control there. And we can just add a few more points in this to make it completely accurate to the shape that we're drawing. And I just like to put in little angles and make them straight and vector and try to keep the original angles usually gives me a pretty cool look and I always also like to find the most minimal amount of points required to get the look that I'm going for so that way no points are wasted with this sometimes that can be tricky as well but it, believe me uh, even though this is a lot of work it all pays off and then of course we can press alt w switch over to hops tool and just bring in this shape and just play with it if we want to in fact I am going to add a few more points here on the end just to kind of give it a flat top we'll first vector it put it at the end make sure that one's a vector as well and there we go of course for that we'll need to uh, just add a few more points in here but now we have a um, little bit more sane shape at least to me for what we're about to be doing so when it comes to profiles and hops we do have a the ability to save it so if you're using like the hops helper you can of course deal with your profile here just like you would in the helper but you also have the ability to save your profile so i'm going to save my profile however it doesn't appear that it was going to save it in the right place so let's see i have a folder already called profiles and this is profile number 36 and i'm going to make sure to copy that folder and save it so when i press control control k we can look at our paths and just make sure that our profiles are set to the right profiles for example and we don't even have our light set to the right uh, light profiles either so let's just set that to light rigs and with control K we can also save our preferences so we don't have to deal with that again and we have saved our profile so that means best of all that All right, looks like I got an error with my folder. Let's press Control K and just see what I did there. And that's correct. All right, so here we are scrolling through our custom profiles. Just needed to double check my folder. It appears to be what my error was. And here I am scrolling through the profiles. However, I don't want to use those profiles. I want to use the profile that we just created. So we'll adjust the size of it. And from here, we can choose to just screw it. If you see all blue whenever you choose screw, that means everything works out. However, if you were to rotate it and work from a different angle, like this one, let's just work from this angle for the purposes of this, and you were to perform a screw, you might get more unacceptable results like what we're seeing here. If everything's all red, you might need to press C to calculate or even press F to flip. F to flip is also good. And here we are looking at our spun result. However, we want to shift click sharpen in order to get everything shaded just right by scrolling it in. And then we can Alt D, uh, Alt W, switch over to box cutter. Sorry, I don't know where my mind is today. And just begin making a few cuts. And, you know, as always, I just um, always start off a little random, kind of working on things um, until I get things to uh, make sense. When it comes to mirror, I like to press Alt X to bring it up. And then I press X to reset it. And then from there, I can just mirror it on the Z. So sometimes if you use previous settings, they'll still be there. And so resetting it very quickly is important to us. So just know inside of Mirror, you can just do that with X. And we will just continue working some cuts in. We see that it's uh, working on our integrity of our shape itself, but that's fine. We can deal with that in our own way later on. I'm just going to bring out a box, press W, turn that into a wedge. And you'd think I would mirror it to the other side, but you know, I think I've been doing that for 365 days, so um, we will change that for this one and just keep it only on this side until the end when I finally break that. But here we are looking at our shape so far. And, you know, we talked about Everscroll and how you can use it to scroll through your modifiers. Sometimes I like to use it to uh, scroll to a state and then shift click to apply. And this will give me a duplicate of the object modified and applied to that particular state. And then from there, I can just delete everything else. And let's just extend this and press EX. And we'll just uh, bevel this area. 
And let's just select this object and select this one and alt X mirror it across this object using this one. And let's just take this chance to just use curve extract to turn this particular selection into a curve. One of my favorite things to do with these solenoid exercises, the whole purpose of them is to be a kind of modeling exercise to help you find Zen before you start getting to the rigmarole and frustration of actual working. Because, you know, once you start doing that, you're going to begin wishing for the end of the day. Because, you know, it always is long. Let's try that again. Accidentally uh, hit the draw dot. So we'll start here and bring this in. We don't actually want to wedge. Got to watch it with those hotkeys sometimes. Looking at the screen. And we'll shift it to live, but we'll select this and control click on mark in order to perform a reverse bevel. And so with this reverse bevel, we can now go ahead and just click on um, radial array, except we want to control click it to radial array around the 3D cursor. And placing about six of these will do us right. And this is what we're looking at so far with our solenoid. I mean, don't really worry about the side. We can always deal with that however we want to. In fact, let me show you one way I would deal with that. I would just put a loop cut in here. And of course we see that it breaks everything and that's because there's a vertex group here and we don't want to interfere with that. So if we press control G, it will remove it from the active group. We see that this is now clean and we can just bring this out to uh, kind of space out that shading a little bit. Of course, if we get in too far, it's going to start causing us some problems. In fact, it's causing us some problems already. So what we want to do is delete any geometry on the inside, which also breaks things. Visually, you probably can't tell it's broken, but I can tell. If we press Alt V and use face orientation, we can see that things aren't calculated just right with our screw modifier. And so the easiest way to fix that is to go under uh, screw and we can just press C to calculate and we can press F to flip. And now we're actually using this correctly where it's calculating correctly and then flipping. And so if we want to fix this shading, we could also do that. Like we want to take it a step further. Um, one of my favorite things to do is start working on a solenoid at a resolution small like 36 and then up it as time goes on near the end, especially once you start getting the bevel in here. But for now, let's continue cutting on this. And we're just trying to uh, just have a little fun with our solenoid and it appears that, you know, I was thinking that I should mirror this object across this object and I did it. And of course, here I am bringing back this object where I will do the same thing, allowing it to just mirror across, giving me a more unified look to it. And let's just continue on with our solenoid. So I'm now going to draw one more cut here. We'll just take that area out and let's just keep going with it. So just bringing out my cut, just working this area and we'll press X to um, reverse this. Actually, we don't want to go that route where we're separating things out. Sometimes people wonder why I do separations uh, and why I do solidifications instead. It's because solidifications allow the object to remain together while um, you know slicing will make it into a different object, which will affect my ability to scroll it later because you know scrolling multiple objects isn't a thing yet until it's a thing. But for now, um, you can only scroll a single object. So sometimes I'm like, you know what, for the scroll, I should do it. So I just brought the object back a little bit and then extruded it in order to just kind of bring up a little lip. And let's talk about bevel. So we're gonna grab this edge and this edge, giving me a hard time there. Press Control B to bevel it. We'll press C to clamp it. And so always, whenever you clamp and meet, there's going to be one extra edge you have to get rid of or else problems will ensue. So now that we've done that, we can just select the object, go back with box, maybe even press W to begin just working on our wedge angle that we're cutting in to this particular solenoid. And, you know, at the very beginning, we did a cut directly down the center. So let's select this and we will change this to shift and began performing a cut down the center with circle just to make it a little more interesting. We could have taken an easy way out and just let it be a hole, but you know, you should always take an opportunity to try to find some interesting gold 
uh, within that circle by playing with the detail that's available. So we're going to take this chance to control click on radial array and press X a couple of times. And now we have, you know, something a little bit more step. And also this is a slice. So I just realized I made a big uh, mistake again. So how can I go about this? I could delete the object, forget I ever did that. And we could just go and locate that particular cutter, which is still available, even though we deleted its parent and cut something like that. If we want to just keep it scroll worthy, but really I feel there's something that needs to go inside of there. So I'll just, um, draw a circle, but we'll press J and just bring it out just a little bit. And you can see how choky it gets with all these modifiers. Of course, it's beyond time to begin applying things, but we're going to continue on with this. So I'm bringing a shape back, got quite a few mods. However, you know, you've watched me build this thing up. You guys have an idea. So continuing on. If we wanted to uh, just scroll this to, in fact, let's take this and select both of these and just union that together. And let's bring back this object through ever scroll. And we want to remove decimate and put a subdivision on it. So that way it joins to it quite nicely. So now all of this is one. If we shift scroll through ever scroll, we can actually see this object as it's built up. It started off like that and then it got a custom profile and then it began going through the rigmarole with all the booleans that we began stacking on. In fact, we only really added about 20 booleans here. And I'm assuming that we didn't do anything with exact. The easiest way to find out is to go in the boolean helper where you can look and see if any of your booleans are using the exact algorithm because sometimes that can cause issues with speed. But with that, we've now created our solenoid. Like I said, at the end, I always raise the amount of segments on my spin in order to increase the shading viability a little bit. So let's just jump it up to 48. We see that it looks a lot better. We jump this up to 64, it will look a lot better, but also it will also add a lot of geometry. So if we look at the wireframe, it's really not that bad considering the amount of detail that we cut in, but it's always nice to uh, step these things up dynamically as you're working on them, especially when it comes to the apply process. You definitely shouldn't apply without giving some consideration to the mods that you're about to apply. And maybe even at the very least, make a duplicate file and save a, a version of it before the uh, big apply of 2020, just in case you, um, 2020 your file. So, you know, me being me, I can't stop. I'm going to bring this in and shift to live, even though I'm really hitting my limits. And to reset the axis on this, the easiest way is to select both of them and just press Q, reset axis, and we can just press X, which didn't work. We'll press Y because we changed our axis at the very beginning. And we could just control click mark in order to continue adding this uh, detail to the mesh. In fact, we see that it's not going to work out very well with our cylinder. So me personally, I like to actually try to force these things to work. So I'm looking for the very first balloon that we created, the originator of this, and we'll just put some loop cuts on it in order to quarantine this area. And we see that the shading just looks just a little bit better. So the next thing from here is actually promoting this to bevel, which means that we're probably gonna to need to deal with some of this stuff that we've done. Like we cut these little ticks in, the angle bevel is definitely gonna catch that and it's gonna become some problematic situation. So let's see if we can identify that particular boolean. It's this one. We've now brought it back to reality using hops tool and the dots. So we'll just adjust the bevel to look something smaller. And we're just looking at what we have and thinking about where we can go next with this. In fact, I still feel that we could select this, press S shift X to scale it on every axis, but X to make it just a little bit smaller and get a really fine hole. And this leaves us this really big flatty area at the top. So let's talk about that. We can use shift click on smart apply to also get us a smart apply duplicate. However, this one's a uh, duplicate at the final level. And we're just going to just select all this geo off of this duplicate. Keep in mind that this is a duplicate. So whenever I'm working in this state, I always work fast because I don't want to get tripped up and think that I'm working on the main object. And even though this inset failed, 
I'm, I'm going to force it to work. So sometimes that requires just sliding around a little bit of geometry because things will just overshoot. Blender be Blender. And so I spent a lot of time studying a lot of these failure points that come up, trying to understand what they are and how they happen and how we could uh, go about conquering them and getting past them and you know what it takes and at least you know how we can let users be more aware that these sort of issues can happen and you know if you're not aware of how blender is you probably come in thinking that this is a um very feature complete well done program but you know blender be blender um everything's always a, a summer of code away you know from from being its uh, true form so don't know don't judge it too harshly but you know one of the big limits you're definitely going to run into in blender starting out is misusing subdivision you know i see so many posts of people who um just put subdivision where it ain't needed and wonder why their computers choke or they're cutting with subdivision present and wondering why things choke you know those are some things that um definitely have a performance hit so it's worth giving them some consideration before um implementing them into your scene because sometimes the cost isn't a cost that you want to pay just like exact sometimes you don't want the cost that comes with exact so being aware that exact is going on so that you can either mitigate it or plan for it is always a smart idea and by exact i'm talking about the the different boolean systems so we'll shift click and apply this to live and we'll go under mesh tools and control click radial array to radiate this pressing x to change which, which axis we're radiating this around and we just want to roll the wheel enough that we get it just right i mean i'm trying to also make it correlate with the mirror a little bit but if we look at this, this is now the result of us just, um, you know, mucking around and creating our final solenoid of the year. So, you know, to top it off, we want to put a bevel on top of it because the bevel will be the toughest and everyone struggles with that. So let's put a bevel on it. Let's press one in order to adjust our shading. And we see that we got to bring it in a little bit because there's a little bit of overlap just happening in front of my face, but really, it's not too bad you know we have to shrink it according to all these areas where we were just too near with things but that's just the cost that you have to pay when it comes to dealing with the bevel that's built in here's another area where there's just a little bit of artifacting it's also happening here is it the worst thing is it worth us lowering it all the way down just to get around i think the answer is uh, probably not so maybe there's something that could actually be done about that Let's um, go through our ever scroll and we'll roll the wheel until we find the boolean that actually started that calamity. And with luck, we'll just come across it. Actually, that problem is not caused by a, a boolean. That problem is caused by a bevel. A bevel profile. So we're just gonna play with our points just get it to something a little more reasonable. And let's alt click sharpen and just fix the shading once and for all. So that way we can really uh, step back and admire what we're looking at here. Also, where's this area? That's not it. There's one area that just isn't looking right and it's this one. So if you add extra loops, they just get sent to random places that they're not needed. So what's the problem here is that we need to actually go under bevel and alt scroll in order to lower the angle to catch that area. But we don't want to catch the cylinder. As you can see, I was catching it just a little bit and that's about as big as we are allowed with this particular iteration of the model. But there we are looking at our final solenoid of the year. So I'm going to go under power save and we'll just call this solenoid and power save. And we see it does my 30 second solenoid power saved with power save brought to you by power save and let's just alt m slap it with a blank material everything's looking good so far and this is our shape and of course if we don't like the color we can shift click material scroll to just scroll through endless iterations of materials until we find the one that we want maybe that one is a little bit more to my liking so we save this one i'm going to press Control shift s and we're going to put a underscore 
one on this so we save it with the uh, underscore one iteration and you know I, I just love selecting stuff and just pressing QOT uh, pressing space switching the plane because I'm still in v2 v2 is still the default you have to opt in to use 1.5 at this time until everything is completely perfect with it and there's still some things that I feel could be just a little bit better we'll press alt VB or actually alt VV and just find a good environment for us to look at for this maybe something like that a little, little dark overcast and then we can press alt VB and just roll in some lights and just roll through lighting setups until we just find a randomized setup that will suit us for the purposes of just showcasing our little solenoid. So something like that will do. However, I might want to shift scroll through the floor to just find something that's either way shinier or less shiny. I mean, that milky one right there also looks pretty crazy. We get in and look at our solenoid and this is our final result. I mean, this was just 20 hours 20 hours, 20 minutes of just us just kind of BSing. And not only were we able to cut all these interesting, very troublesome cuts into it, we we're able to also end it with the bevel without even having to talk about weld. And we can still go in and do the same little inset trick that we did on the outside with this area. And, you know, it's the end of the year. So let's save the file and let's do that. We can't do it with this object because there's all these modifiers live. So let's just shift click smart apply. And we'll just deal with our duplicate and I'm just holding control and clicking from face to face to just get everything in between. And this is just a really um, nice way to move around whenever you're dealing with in gone meshes. So I'm just insetting control I deleting everything that wasn't what we were just looking at, realizing that we need a lot more inset going on. So maybe something like that and let's end remove it again and let's go on local mode and you probably could have realized that you know I could have um, just stopped while I was ahead and let that be but instead we want to learn from this and turn this into a learning experience about how you can get in and deal with these sort of failures when they happen because you know it's not a, a problem of if it's just a problem of of when I mean not even a problem a question it's a question of when because everyone's going to run into issues. Everyone's going to run into performance hangs or things not working optimally or a button not being what it's supposed to be compared to what you thought it was going to be and all these sort of things. But just know that, you know, we're there for you. And I'm always at the will, doing everything in my power to make sure that these tools are at their best shape, even for an event like New Year's. So here we are just dissolving points, just cleaning things up. When it comes to dissolving, it's an easy answer, just the useless ones. You know, some of these stick out so far, the only way they can go is out of this galaxy through the power of Control X, one of my favorite hotkeys in Blender. We can just dissolve points and we see that the adjacent edges are also removed. I mean, we don't have to go so far, I'm being a little OCD with this, but Let's press Q, solidify, press 2, and we can now come back here, select the main shape, perform a difference, and did that work out for us? It, it appears so. Um, I saw an area up here that didn't look very good. I don't know if I'm really uh, digging what is going on here. Let's just bring it out, try to even it a bit. And with this area, we also see that we've hit some limits of our bulls just being too close together. And just using a little bit of uh, ever scroll to recall the right cutter at the right time, at just the right moment, we can move that and just give this geometry a little bit more flexibility. So let's talk about this area. We could either shrink our, bull, our bevel to get it to work, or we can do the dance of messing with bull shapes to get it to work. But for this one, I'm going to try a different trick. We're going to bring in weld and I'm going to roll into weld and then shift roll the weld up one and we'll click to apply. And we see that weld was able to help us a little bit. We're getting a little bit more flexibility out of our geometry here. And so if we look at our stack, we see that this stack has gotten quite immense with us putting the right modifier at just the right time for us to be able to continue working. And that's really, you know, what hard ops is all about. So, to really wrap this thing up, what I will do is, well, firstly, 
The reason that we did all this is so we can do a scroll. So I'm just going to draw a box around this and just shift click on ever scroll and we can just roll this through until we get to the conclusion. And this is something I love doing. You know, anytime I'm working, I always do a scroll just to show the process that I took in order to get to a final result. And so now we can really just uh, take this thing to task because it's all just one color, it's so boring. So we're gonna need to slice it up. We're gonna need to, um, and also we're on the underscore two of this file, meaning that we can probably do whatever we want at this point. But I'm being very delicate with these cuts because I don't want to introduce any problems at this point. We've already uh, fought our bevel to the point of it being you know, pretty nice. Also, it'll be a lot easier if we put a mirror on this. So let's shift A and we'll just play say empty of a sphere. And let's just place it here and we'll just select all our components and the empty, all text and just mirror that across. So we just have a double ended solenoid. It's just easier uh, than figuring out the other side, even though we could um, go ham on the other side as well. But I don't think um, Blender's gonna take it. We're already pushing our luck. I know that there's uh, some strangeness happening with 2.92 as it is, and I'm just committed to always doing our demos in the latest version of Blender for some reason at this time. So we'll just cut another piece out. We see that that piece also gave us a little bit of a hang because you know we're at we're at the end game now let's perform a cut from the top except we want to use view and let's also turn on pause mode because we want our performance back so we'll just perform our cut no shame in using pause mode it just means that you know you've hit the limit of your computer everyone has limits it just happens We'll just dissolve that edge and just turn this into a wedge. And let's just bring this to the other side. And then we can alt X mirror it to the other side, except I want a little bit of a gap in between. Thought that looked cool. Keep in mind that rotation I did at the beginning to change which axis I'm working on, that one choice continues to haunt me to this moment. Uh, making this demo just a little bit harder than usual, but I'm just so used to being X centered that you, you remove me, remove that from me and um, puts me in a world of hurt. So I'm going to draw another box and because we're still in pause mode, I can just press space bar and it will just calculate everything after the operation. Of course, sometimes that may take a second, but we're at that point in the solenoid that we are pretty brutal on the computer. So continuing on, um, might also want to slice the front of this off. So let's do that. Take this moment. You know, one of the things that I'm told often internally is that, you know, for every slice you do, you are basically duplicating the work that's being done by the computer and the amount of modifiers it's having to keep up with and create derived meshes of. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, if things begin getting slow and you're dealing with slices, we would have gotten a lot further if we would slice things at the beginning, but instead we're slicing things at the very end game. So, you know what could go inside the solenoid is um, an icosphere. You know, don't judge me. And we'll just alt click it. And where's our empty? Not that empty. We want that and we want that and that and then alt X to mirror that to the other side. And we go back to our render and this is what we're looking at so far with our result, something like that. And, you know, let's have a little more fun with things. So, you know, we want even more glowy lights in our solenoid, you know, so RX90, RZ90, just gonna be giving me a business all day and we'll just place a curve here and give it the same emissive material in fact we can um, even uh, control click and mirror it across the same empty so that way we have this happening on both sides and this video is already approaching 30 minute mark so that is my cue to definitely wrap things up so we'll get our view align just the way we want it and we can just press Q, add camera with nothing selected. 
and get our camera placed just right. Maybe scale the empty to scale the camera. And so the next thing is, of course, uh, depth of field. With depth of field, we can just click on the camera to select the camera. And I'm going to enable depth of field and we'll set our target to be this Bezier circle. And as we lower it, we can see the depth of field coming in. We don't want too much that takes focus, but just enough will do the job. I'll jump back into viewport adjust and press Q in order to make bloom come on because we have 10 different ways to enable bloom. But if you want to do it the long way, you can always go to the helper and under the render panel, there's an option for you to turn bloom off and on and adjust the settings. So now we are looking at the complete solenoid. We can press Alt V B if we want to just scroll through different light setups, depending on how we want to, of course, present this thing. But solenoids are always just a fun way to get used to hard ops and having fun with the uh, Blender Boolean workflow. But we'll just right click, go back to current. And if I begin playing, it's gonna begin playing just too fast. We want something a little more chill. We want to click on frame range, which will set us to 6,000 frames unless you press F9 and you choose how many frames you want it to be. So now if we let this play, this is the result of our work here with creating a solenoid. But that's not how you, you, you play your animation when it comes to hops. We'll go to the hops button and under about where it's telling us we need to update, we're going to control click on the about button and this will bring up the pong credits. And from here, we can then play pong and then if we want, we can even press A and the animation will just keep playing in the background and we can just continue on defeating the enemies in red who seek to overtake us. But with that, we can wrap up this video. Thank you all for watching. Happy New Year and I'll see you guys next time. So one of the questions I get asked a lot is how do you retrieve your cutter? How do you get back your cutter after you've lost it? For example, if we were to press D and switch over to box and we were to perform just a simple box cut, we see that the shape just disappears. However, if we were to shift A, bring in a cube and scale it to fit and select both of them and press Q and choose difference, we see that the shape is still there for now because the cutter collection is still enabled. But if we were to press one to just get to our main collection, disable the cutter collection, we see that it's gone. And so a popular question is how do I retrieve my cutter? So the first thought that comes to mind is using the scroll system, which if you have an object like so that has what we call pending booleans, which are booleans that are not applied, you should press Q and there will be an option there called every scroll and just clicking it by default will allow you to begin scrolling through your booleans and you can just click and just choose the boolean that you want. Another way you can retrieve your booleans is through the hops button drop down, which we intend to be there for anything to assist new users, but you can go here, enable boolean and you can actually choose to enable and disable collections and there will even be a nice little wire display. Clicking the operation button will actually change what operation is being performed. If we want to turn this into a union or a difference or a slice, we can just on the fly by clicking these buttons. And through this, you can even change the algorithm that's being used depending on your version of Blender. So right now we're using the fast system since it's the fastest, but if you use exact, it, it'll definitely take a very large speed hit. Even if it's not the active modifier being adjusted, just having it present can sometimes cause quite a bit of a performance loss. So do use it with caution. But this is just another way you can get back your booleans on the fly if you're needing to retrieve your bull shape.
Another way that you can do it, and one of my favorites is just pressing Alt W and switching over to what we call Hops Tool. And in Hops Tool, you can just hold Control and some dots will appear. And just hovering over these dots will show the shape and then clicking will bring the shape back. And this is probably one of our more interactive ways to bring back your cutters. But uh, for those who are just sticking with the Q menu regimen, you can just press Q, go in every scroll and just begin scrolling and bring back your cutters just on the fly without any further issues. One of the more interesting areas of hard ops is the hops button where you can have quick access to all sorts of interesting options if you're a beginner, but the star here represents the opt-ins area where clicking on the opt-ins will bring you to the basically the controversial options area of hard ops. And if you're following an older tutorial, you may want to change it from every to classic. And for the purpose of this example, I'll just show the classic system, which is what we're referring to the old system as. And if we press Q, we see an option here for mod scroll toggle. And this was always a mouthful to say. And so basically clicking it would activate something called bull scroll, which is actually its own type of scroll. And then if you press Q, you could um, hover over it, see the tooltip, and you can see that shift clicking will take you into modifier scroll where you can actually scroll through the modifiers. In the very end, we added the ability for it to show the wires of the modifiers that are being added, not as a um, object visibility selection, but more as a, a kind of visual flare to just let you know what's cutting in and creating what. And I was quite proud of this. My favorite things is if we look at the help, there's control, uh, left mouse button which will apply the visible mod so you can basically scroll to an area and hold control and click and it will actually apply those modifiers so if we undo we crash blender devastatingly so it's over there but let's just go ahead and open that again because you know that's just part of life that's what happens when you apply a ton of modifiers and then you undo it very fast however I've been warned that there are some issues going on in the latest version of 2.92 that probably make it not the best idea for me to be demonstrating it, but continuing on. So we are going to go back to our opt-ins and we're gonna change this to classic and we'll press Q and just shift clicking this, we can just scroll through and you can see that I have quite a few modifiers on here. Another interesting thing that I liked about this is that you could scroll to a point and you could shift click in order to apply a duplicated version and this would be a duplicate version and the original version would be reverted to its maximum modified version. And so we could just take these two pieces, press I, inset it, press control I, invert it. And now we just have this piece that we can just solidify and cut into the mesh. And, you know, getting a piece like this for something that we intend to get non-destructive is something that normally isn't very easy. So having this kind of derived mesh workflow where you can derive a mesh and then uh, employ it later to create a cut similar to this and then still have the power of sorting to cut it to the other side, there's definitely a lot of magic to be had inside of the classic mod bull scroll toggle. However, let's move on and begin now talking about every scroll. So now we are back and let's take a moment to press Q and hover over every scroll. And by hovering over it, we can see the tooltip where left click will bring up booleans, shift clicking it will bring up modifiers, control clicking it will bring up child objects, and alt clicking it will smart apply. So let's take a moment and just left click it and we bring up the boolean mode. And everything seems the same as your traditional bull scroll. And that is the goal. We wanted everything to feel exactly the same so that way there'd be no reason for anyone to ever have to revert back to the previous one. However, the verbiage of the classic version and the way that it worked on a technical level was just becoming difficult to maintain and was beginning to experience some bugs that was just a little difficult for us to continue justifying dealing with, especially as better systems were coming out over time. It just became apparent that it was worthy of rewriting. So here we are looking at the rewrite and you see that there's really not a whole lot going on with it. You're still just rolling your mouse and scrolling through it. There's still a list showing you exactly which bullion you're doing. There's still a wire overlay. However, if we press tab, we jump into an expanded mode. And of course, with expanded, there's handles where we can click and drag these handles in order to place our modifier stack where we want. And we can continue, of course, scrolling through the stack as we could before. And there's a lot that you can do with this that you couldn't before. In fact, all of the help items are clickable. So for example, if I were to click on control uh, left mouse button here, it would go ahead and apply visible mods similar to what you expect in the uh, previous one. But even more interestingly is you can actually scroll over the top of the expanded UI and it will change through the various settings. However, there's also hotkeys for that. So let's go ahead and right click and back up. So we press Q 
and we jump into Everscroll again. So right now we're in something called the fast UI, which means there's no interactivity to it. It's just visual objects placed on screen optimized for speed. We don't want any sort of um, visual hang here or anything to choke up the system. We want you to get in, do your operation, and get out. However, if you press shift tab, you can actually jump the type. So now we're in modifier scroll. So this was something you couldn't do previously. You weren't able to just shift tab in order to just jump over into modifier scroll as you see me doing here. I can shift tab again. And now I'm in something called children scroll where I'm actually scrolling through the children of this object and I'm able to see what's there. And really it's quite handy whenever you're dealing with a hierarchy of objects. For example, if you're dealing with a character, sometimes you want to actually grab things specifically by the child. Um, you know, don't grab me FBI. But we press shift tab and we're back over to bull scroll, back in a familiar bull scroll that we all know and love. And as always, you can just press tab to just jump into this expanded mode. So we look at this and we see that there's additional options here. There's an option for us to turn the mod off and on. There's an option for us to just flat out apply the mod. And there's even an option here for us to add it to visibility. So you can go in and actually click on a name to see what Boolean it is and choose to click and add it to the visibility of what's going to be left behind on this uh, v visible layer that we're looking at whenever you're done with the operation. So we're just going through clicking and picking and choosing what we want and just adding it to visibility. And this is something you can do in the fast mode as well. However, it's a lot more intuitive whenever you're in this screen. In fact, at this point, we could either add it to visibility by clicking the button, or we could just click to apply this particular operation that we're doing, and it will just give us this as our active selection with the rest of them all being in the background. But it allows us to quickly jump to this object, do what needs to be done, and then jump to the rest of it. So that's really a kind of quick overview of what Everscroll is, just in a nutshell, and how you can get started with it. So by default, whenever you first begin using Everscroll, you will just click it and it will jump into fast mode, FAS by the way, and you can press tab to jump into expanded mode. However, there is an alternative way to jump into expanded mode every time if you want to use it in that particular state. Let's press control K, which will bring up the hops preferences and we'll jump over to properties where we have options for the scroll and under scroll type, we can choose our scroll UI to come up as expanded under here. And if you want to save that as your default, you can use in the three lines at the bottom. And we'll just go ahead and do that. And now at this point, if we jump into Everscroll, we still have that same behavior, but we have this fully clickable dynamic UI up on screen, which normally I don't need this because I'm so used to using the hotkeys. After all, I am the one who requested everything that's in it. But I can just scroll through, use it as I need, particularly find the bull end that I need, scale it out, select the object, go back in, and just you know, continue on with the work that needs to be done with performing adjustments and getting this object to be absolutely perfect. But just being able to choose between fast and expanded was something that we want to add to this as well, just because there's so much more that can be done to this than meets the eye. So I'll be going over it more and more in depth as this video continues. However, I just wanted to show just a quick section talking about how you can set your ever scroll to load up in expanded mode or in the fast mode, depending on the way that you feel like working with it. So for this example, we'll just set up a simple shape. So I'm going to delete the cube, shift A, add a cylinder, and we'll just scale that down. In fact, let's shift A, add the cylinder again. And instead of letting it have 32, we're gonna give it like 16, just so it comes out a little bumpy. And we'll shift D, duplicate here, S, Z, to S, shift Z to scale it down on every axis, but the Z keeping these to have the exact same depth. We'll select both of them and just go under Q, operations, and to shape, and press spacebar, and we'll just change this over to be convex. I've been playing a lot with convex lately, and let's just click to apply that, and we'll shift H to get rid of this. And so let's press Q and sharpen it, and so everything looks all right, you know. However, it's a little faceted due to issues with the geometry, but let's just ignore that. Let's actually uh, bring back one of our cylinders, not that cylinder, we'll bring back that one. And we're just going to use active only so that that way we can use this center point to just cut into this first shape. And we'll just hide this cylinder, we don't need it because it's obscuring our cut. And we see that we now have a situation where we have a cut in our shape, but we have a shape that just doesn't have the right resolution. And so for this reason, we added a feature a while back called first subdivision, where you can add a subdivision to the top of the stack. 
And so before I show how to, you could use it correctly, I want to show how you're more than likely going to use it incorrectly. So that means you're going to alt click it and it's just going to work out because I accidentally forgot to sharpen it. Here we go. So normally if you don't have anything marked as sharp, it's not going to work out for you. So just running a sharpen and we'll be able to get this looking good. And so now we have a subdivision modifier at the start of the stack and then we have a boolean. So our shape is shaping up now instead of looking a little inadequate compared to before. All right, so continuing, we'll just keep working this area, just cutting in some details, you know, nothing major. Shift that to live, that's just too bad of an angle to let that live. And then we'll, you know, cut a little narrow pieces in here. And you know what, this area actually kind of worked out for us, didn't it? So let's just take the whole area and cut it in over in this area and you know we could actually repeat that in multiple areas so let's ever scroll bring that back and I'm just going to go under mesh tools and control click radial array to rotate around the radial um, the 3d cursor area and I don't want it to go around all the way like it is so I'll press R to lower the radius to something like 180 We'll just place a couple of these in there. And you know, this is what we're looking at so far, right? And let's say that we actually wanted to apply some of these modifiers. So let's go into Everscroll and we're already in modifier scroll and in expanded off the bat because we specified that in our preferences. And one of the good things is that whenever you start modifier scroll, it doesn't actually turn all the modifiers off until you scroll it once. And then all the modifiers get turned off and then you can begin progressively scrolling back to bring back all your modifiers. However, Sometimes you want to apply a particular modifier like you see me doing here Like for example, if I went ahead and just applied this modifier It's more likely going to be massacred alive by the subdivision at the very top So just to show that in action, let's go ahead and just click it and it looks like it worked out Let's click that one and we can actually see the bullions being eaten alive by the subdivision modifier as we're clicking These apply buttons out of order and so this is something that I foresaw users running into as an issue And so let's talk about that situation again we're already in just scroll, so let's just roll the wheel to just jump over to modifier. And let's say we actually want to apply this modifier. Instead of clicking the check, you can shift click it and it will apply to that point. So now we actually have only these modifiers remaining. And then by clicking, we've applied it. And basically this is now our shape. But just letting you know that there's apply to capabilities added inside of mod scroll and it's just something that i've wanted for a while um you know we have so many different apply systems inside of hard ops ranging from smart apply to c sharpen which is one of our first solutions for applying back in the day but isn't used so much now in lieu of the rise of smart apply and now i'm letting you know that ever scroll is capable of applying things even better so let's press x and delete this press alt w jump over to hops tool and we'll bring up hops tool which as you know, you bring in one of these boxes, they have a plethora of modifiers because that was the goal. We were trying to create these complex modifier objects to just kind of have fun with it. And we already have our extraction on the clipboard. So why not just use it again? And we'll just look at this from top view, draw an end gun backspace because that line was off. And let's try that again. And we can just bring this down. And this is what we're looking at so far, right? And if we just shift click to just jump into our modifiers, we can begin scrolling up what our modifiers are that comprise this object. And you can see that it starts off as a point that is then extruded and then extruded again to become a plane and then is mirrored and then is decimated to remove the point in the middle. If we press Z, we can actually turn on wireframe. And you can see how at this point it was being mirrored over and then it gets decimated, which makes it into nothing, allowing us to bevel all the points, weld any points that are not supposed to be there, solidify it, bevel it, weld those points that aren't supposed to be there, and then we're performing our bullions, and then we're putting a bevel on top along with our weighted normal. However, if we wanted to apply these bullions, let me just tell you that because this object was built out of a point in space, there is no size to it. There's nothing to it. It's just a point at this point, even with all these modifiers on it. So in order to properly apply any of these, we would need to shift click to apply up to a point. And then from here, we can actually, you know, click and apply one of these and we can scroll through what's left. 
however, for some reason not let me. Let's try it again. Actually, I was pressing the wrong button there. I don't know what's going on with me today. I am off. But here we are just scrolling through the last remaining modifier. So the apply to capabilities are there to assist you with getting the most out of just jumping through uh, these modifiers and getting them applied very quickly to help you get on your way quicker because there's no reason to hang on to the past forever, especially when it becomes at the point that it begins slowing down performance on your computer. Even me, I'm using an i9 and I reached the limits with it. And with the Threadripper, it literally had no limits that were able to be reached because it died at the starting line but whenever it comes to applying things it's definitely an important part of life you know people come into blender thinking that you're able to just keep modifiers live forever because they don't have any idea about the history of performance that blender struggled with and just think that everything's just peachy when really there's such limits that you must take into consideration and that our tools are aimed to help you you know get the most out of that and if we look at this we see that the sort is just completely out of control here uh, weighted normal is supposed to be at the end. Uh, interesting thing about weighted normal is if you have weighted normal present, you just click it, it will just resort your modifier, placing weighted normal where it's supposed to go. So that's just one of the benefits of hard ops in the sort system is that it's pretty integral and built into everything. But continuing on, now that we have our modifier stack making sense again, let's press Q and shift click ever scroll. And we keep begin scrolling through our modifiers and we see that we're able to just scroll through and see our new stack of modifiers completely different than the ones that we dealt with before but we're still building a nice humble little stack as we continue working on our piece here all right so what i'm going to do is take this hops tool and just delete it and we'll jump over and just bring in another shape and we're going to just press alt w jump over to box cutter and just begin cutting immediately and just put a couple of cuts in here you know we can press w play with wedge we see that our bevel's not catching right there, so we can just hold Alt and scroll it back until it does catch. Just continue cutting in here. Of course, weld is still on, so pressing W a couple of times will cut wedge right off so you can get back to work making your unwedge cuts. However, sometimes you just got gotta just keep on cutting those wedges once you get started, just detailing everywhere with them. But I like how you can press W and just press uh, press W during the draw now in order to change it from wedge to box even before you begin the extrusion process. So any events you're drawing under wedge and you just want to turn it back to box, you can do that even before. So we're just drawing this shape, just getting started. And so here we are, we have our box, a lot of modifiers. So let's just jump into our bull scroll. And bull scroll looks quite interesting when there's a lot of non-Boolean modifiers in your stack. Of course, we can just scroll through it and just find whatever Booleans we want. We could press A in order to add them to visibility, just like we could by clicking these A and R buttons over here. But the most interesting thing is that the apply to behavior that I discussed previously also applies here. If we were to try to apply this Boolean, because we didn't apply all the modifiers leading up to it, it's just not going to work out. However, if you shift click the check, it will apply all of the modifiers leading up to it, including that modifier. And this is something that I have wanted forever. And just now that it's part of everything, it's just great. I hope that users um, make their way with this and, you know, make fine uses of it just as I do. But, you know, and the best part is even though I applied these, I could continue just applying stuff and none of this is permanent. I can just right click cancel and none of that happened. And I can just go back into bull scroll again and let's try it again. We actually want to apply all the bullion say to here. So we'll just shift click and then click to apply. And now if we uh, select this object and shift click ever scroll, these are the modifiers that are present that are remaining for this. So if you need to apply up to a certain point, you have everything in your power in order to do so. If you want to see something really interesting with this new um, modifier scroll and what it can do is we will just shift click to go into our modifier scroll and let's just apply everything up to the bevel. So let's just shift click with the arrow right above and then we'll just click to apply. And let's just alt click sharpen or put away normal. And we're gonna just move this over. And we already have an empty in the center. So let's just use that. So we're just gonna shift click, select both of them and press alt X and using modifier, we're just gonna mirror this on the other side of this object. In fact, let's change this empty over to being a sphere 
and let's right click it to make its draw size bigger. And if we move the empty, of course, we're adjusting the mirror of this object. And let's make it even more interesting. Let's go in and use dice. And we're just gonna dice it uh, vertically. And we'll use the method of knife, even though it may not work out for us, but let's try it. And here we are looking at our diced object. And let's just select everything in edit mode, press A to deselect all, and we'll just select this area, press Q, and under add modifier, we're just going to place a lattice. And I know what you're thinking, what the heck is he doing? So we're just going to add a couple of spans and grab this and just move it out. And here we are just latticing a box into something a little more random. Of course, there's limitations on the randomness because we didn't dice at the other axis, so we're a little limited. But here we are using a lattice and a mirror to create this object. And in case you forgot what we just did to this, let's hold, let's press Q and we can just go through modifier scroll and you can see that, you know, there's a bevel and then there's a mirror and then there's a lattice and then there's a way to normal. And the interesting thing about uh, modifier scroll and the expanded state is if there's an object there that needs to be brought back, you can actually just shift click and it will bring back the object associated with that modifier. And this was something that I personally requested and I'm very happy to say as part of the new modifier scroll. And there's actually no other way to bring it back in hops other than this. I mean, you could alt H and bring back these objects, but using this actually makes things just a little bit easier for you if you're working with uh, multiple objects and modifiers and lattices and deformation objects that you need to grab that are actually contained within the modifier data object parameter itself. So just know that systems have been made to search and locate these things and bring them to the forefront for you. Let's go ahead and just right click cancel and I'm just gonna press undo and just hold undo down until it just stops undoing. And let's see how far we were able to undo. And we weren't able to undo very far. So that means let's just delete this box, bring in another box, and we'll Alt W, jump into box cutter. And it looks like we're in end gone now. So you know what, I can work with that. We will just uh, switch over to line box in order to make a line that matches what our end gone gave us and begin drawing some additional cuts along this as well. Just, um, you know, cutting out what we have here. And we want to actually bring back that scroll. So one of the first things I want to show is that when you jump into bull scroll, the first boolean that comes up is your last cutter. And this is something related to a request on the board that I had for a long time called last cutter, where basically you would normally have to roll the wheel back once in order to get your last cutter, but now we've made it where you will get your last cutter off the bat, and then if you begin rolling, you can begin progressing through your other cutters, of course, but that last cutter is always normally the one that you want, or at least that's our assumption. Then, of course, you can click to receive that cutter, and I can move it around because I saw it get a little bit wonky with the bevel in this area, so I just wanted to get that under control. But the thing that I wanted to talk about for this one is that if we were to um, press Q and go inside our scroll, we see that there's these icons on the side. And I just want to talk about what they mean in each section. So for Booleans, there are no icons for the modifiers that aren't related to Booleans because of course this is Boolean scroll. It's, your objective is literally to scroll through the Booleans. But this one turns the Boolean off and on, just like toggling the modifier off and on. This one will apply the modifier. And this one will append the boolean to visibility. So in the event that you want to reveal several booleans at once in a more interactive way, you could just press A in order to add it or remove it from visibility, or you can just scroll through and actually find the boolean and just click on the A and turn it to an R and have that appended to your visibility set. So whenever you click to apply, you have all these booleans added or the bull shapes re-added that you can then go in and begin making manual changes on. For example, let's say I wanted to just bring this shape back and just round that bevel at the bottom out. I could just bring it back and very easily do that without any further difficulty. So continuing on, if we look at this and we tap over to modifiers, we see that these icons are in a slightly different order and that is also because they do different things. Um, these two still do the same thing. This will toggle the modifier off and on. This one will now talk about the render visibility of an object. So in some cases, if you are bypassing the render visibility in order to bypass sort, for example, that's what we're doing with this particular mirror here. We have the mirror sort turned off. It's now something that you can visually see whenever you're working and be able to disable, you know, either using sync or you can go in here and actually just turn that R off. But what this means is that whenever we perform another cut, this 
mirror will be sorted all the way to the end of the stack because that's how sort works. The way around it though would probably be to add a second mirror on top and then turn the render visibility off knowing that sort will only deal with the last mirror in the stack. But because there's only one mirror, that's the reason that a hops box actually has the mirror toggle with render visibility off. And that's the reason that we have these R's in the modifier panel to let you know if anything is bypassing render visibility. So just to show render visibility bypassing sort in action, just while I have you here, let's just right click cancel and we scroll down and we see mirror and we have no render visibility on it. And what this means is that if I were to perform a cut, mirror will just stay put. And mirror is actually very integral because it's very early in the stack. It's spin uh, or screw, screw, mirror, then decimate. So it's pretty integral to it. If we were to just disable it, we probably are going to live, it, it appears. So let's actually turn on res render visibility and just begin adding another cut. We see that because the modifier got moved, the whole form of the shape changed, which changed basically everything about how the shape worked. So when it comes to working with multiple mirrors in a stack, I always find it easier to just press Alt X, press A to add a new mirror, and just work that way. And so now we have both mirrors in the stack. The first mirror won't have to be disturbed and we can just continue working without having to deal with any problems there. But just in case you ever wondered why you have an R that's disabled, that means that your render visibility is off and you're bypassing sort, which means if you press F12, you won't get the same result that you're looking at, which is why we made sync. But just letting you know that that is here for you whenever you're using mod scroll. And then of course the check boxes are exactly the same as in bull scroll, clicking them will just apply to modifier and shift clicking them will apply them to a particular region. For example, if I want to apply all the constructive booleans that create, or all the constructive modifiers that basically make up this shape, I would apply everything to the weld. And we can see that it says nine modifiers were applied. And so now all we have left are the booleans cutting into the cube. So we're dealing with something a little bit more sane. But as always, whenever you're doing these sort of things, you can always just right click and cancel. As with all our modals that are utilized in the base control system, shift scroll to move modifiers up and down the stack is also still in play. So if we press Q and we go into ever scroll, we can of course choose a Boolean in the stack by scrolling to it. And by shift scrolling, we can move it up and down the stack. Of course, moving it too far up and down the stack is gonna to lead to catastrophic issues because we're interfering with the very construction of the shape itself. But in the event that you're wanting to resort your Booleans in the stack, you can do that on the fly just by holding shift and actually scrolling up and down in order to move a Boolean. When it comes to modifiers, you can also do the same thing, but on a greater level, we can hold shift and scroll and move a modifier up and down the stack if we want. We could scroll to progress it and just experiment with different modifiers modifiers not being present. For example, we'll stop at this point with the first bevel and just go over here and just toggle the decimate off just to see what our results would have been. We can't see it very good, so let's just click on the W to toggle the wire display and let's see what would have happened without the decimate being present. Try it again. And for some reason, I just am not seeing the wire. Let's press Z. Okay, Z is toggle wire display. W is actually toggle wire fade, my apologies. So here we can see what it would be like if we were going through our stack and we had never had certain modifiers present. So here it is if we didn't have decimate present, but we continued on with our weld and then our solidify and then tried to bevel such a thing. We see that without decimate to clean things up, that just wouldn't be possible. We can even move our weld around the stack just by shift scrolling. So I'm just letting you know that the same functionality of the previous scrolls and what you've become used to in our modifier systems is still there. So you'll still be able to move modifiers up and down the stacks as you want. And then of course, right click to cancel if you're not trying to do any of that. So children's scroll is very new to this version of hard ops. So to just show it in action, let's just shift A, add a plane. And we'll place a plane below the object and select this one. Let's just press control P and we'll just make that a parent object, which means that when we rotate this, this object rotates as well. And we could shift A, add another object like a cube and select both of them and just parent the object. Let's shift A, let's add something that isn't a cube, like a text object. Select both of them, control P. Let's also um, parent a speaker, you know, let's be weird with it. So control P, object. And so we select our object and if we move it, we see that of course there's an empty uh, or a mirror object in here controlling the uh, mirror that we're doing. 
but also we have all these objects as children, which is why they're moving along with it. So if we hover over our ever scroll tooltip, we see that control clicking will bring up children scroll. And we see that as we scroll through, we can actually select each of these objects in our scroll, except for some reason that cube, actually the cubes at the top. So my mistake, it looks like it might be alphabetical, but we see that we're able to scroll through all of the objects in our collection and select them. So in the event that you're dealing with a hierarchy situation, like you're building a character or an environment, you may be dealing with parenting and want to just select your children in a very quick and organic fashion. In fact, we can just append these to the visibility. Uh, and then when we click, they're left on screen. And to show that in action, let's actually hide the children. So we rotate it. We see that nothing's happening because we can't see anything. So if we go in and we actually click on these, we see that we're actually bringing them back and we can append them to visibility. We can do the same thing with the plane, with the cube, bring them all back. And then when we click, we have all of our children being displayed on screen just on the fly. So collection scrolling is, Collection scrolling or children scrolling is still very new. We still plan on a couple of more scrolls to be added to this to make it truly complete and justify the reason that we expanded into the EverScroll trilogy. But I do hope that users are able to get the most out of this and find a reason to get in and get scrolling. But for the most part, these tools were made to be a troubleshooter of sorts to allow users to kind of roll through their stacks and diagnose what problems could occur and at what point failure strikes. And, see it visually on screen as a way of diagnostics in front of them for them to get in and deal with it you know we're looking at an object at this point why is our shading looking bad well it's because we don't have the weighted normal on top so with one scroll we bring that back we could right click and just go back to where we were and then of course there's also the apply capabilities in it as well that cannot be uh, overstated definitely get in there and just apply modifiers up to the levels that you want more than likely blender is going to be adding something for it down the road but it's always one of those things I've wanted to do and we've created so many different modifier apply solutions for it and this one is definitely going to be one of my favorites just being able to get in and just shift click to apply to a range and then click and just be done with it and have all of our modifiers applied and cleaned up 